Welcome to the Career Society's live webcast, K-Content, Youth Economy and Beyond. I'm Sungook Lee, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm an influencer in South Korea, and I actually began my career as a YouTuber a few years ago with my own channel. That channel is called Genius SK Lee. Forgive me, I call myself genius. Anyway, um, so I'm thrilled to speak with the group of esteemed speakers today because we're going to talk about the uh, topics that are really that very much related to my own career. We're going to talk about this new industry that's rising, the rise of K-content and new creator economy. Joining us, joining us tonight are Mr. Neil Mohan, Chief, Chief Product Officer at YouTube, and Her Excellency Park young sun She is the former Minister of SMEs and Startups of Republic of Korea. We also nice have- to meet you. Nice to meet you too. We also have um, Mr. Bernie Cho, he's the president of DFSB Collective. And we have Dr. Sumi Terry. She's the director of the Hyundai Motor Korea Foundation Center for Korean History and Public Policy, Wilson Center. Long name. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Welcome to the Korea Society's live webcast, everyone. I'm excited to see you all. Glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my first question for today goes to Bernie. Um, Bernie, I've heard that you've been in this industry for more than 20 years. So can you briefly tell us about the history of K-content as an economic driver in Korea? Sure. Thank you for having me. It's, it's really an honor and pleasure. Um, and, you know, if anything, uh, it's almost very timely that we're talking about YouTube and its role um, and more importantly, its influence on spreading Hallyu, the Korean wave worldwide. Um, for me, I spent my early years uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s um, as a TV producer at MTV Korea. And back then, traditional media was just considered the, the normal media, the regular media, just media period. And that was essentially radio, um, television, newspapers and magazines. And that was it. Um, and then in 2006, something popped up, came up that had to get anybody who's working in media's attention, and that was YouTube. And YouTube launched in Korea in 2008, and the reality was is its beginnings were, were pretty humble and pretty modest. And I think for a lot of entertainment and media professionals, it felt less and less like a professional platform and more and more like sort of a hobby kind of hangout. Um, you know, at most, it was... Um, the go-to place, you know, YouTube was really known for, you know, watching wacky wedding videos, kooky cat videos, and, you know, poo -ha parody videos. But fast forward now to 2021, 2022, and it has been an extremely long, strange, but more importantly, very exciting trip. Um, right now, you know, I think when we look at the history of not just K-pop, but K-pop culture, and its rise, um, not just across Asia, but more importantly, beyond Asia, that conversation, that discussion cannot start and cannot stop without mentioning YouTube. Um, in terms of how important, um, you know, K-pop culture is uh, to the Korean economy, um, K-pop culture exports, and what I mean by K-pop culture, it's not just the music, but TV, film, video games, webtoons, characters, et cetera, et cetera. It is the second largest consumer goods export out of Korea behind automobiles and ahead of consumer electronics and even ahead of smartphones. And so for the Korean economy, uh, K-pop culture is a very important component of the export driven economy. It really is one of the main engines driving the Korean economy. And what's really fascinating is, is that, um, again, as I mentioned before, we're here, to, we're hitting on the 10, 10th anniversary mark of Sai's Gangnam style. And my goodness, what an impact um, Gangnam Style had, not just for Korea, but really for K-pop and for basically for K-pop's um, awareness, appreciation, and more importantly, recognition around the world. Um, thanks to Sai and Gangnam Style, he definitely was able to prove that K-pop was not a fad, but if anything, it was a phenomena uh, post Sai. Um, K-pop music videos viewership on YouTube actually tripled and it didn't stop. It didn't, it, it just kept going. And right now, if you look at the top 25 Korean bands that have channels, 
on YouTube, 90% of the YouTube videos actually come from outside of Korea. And what's really impressive right now is if we look at the most viewed music videos in the first 24 hours of release, K-pop has nine out of the 10 top 10 music videos of all time with basically for the past two years, BTS and Blackpink regularly battling back and forth for the worldwide bragging rights of who will bag the biggest YouTube music video debut on the World Wide Web. And again, coming back to the pioneering, gigantic success of Size Gangnam Style, it was not only the first ever video to hit the 1 billion mark, it also hit the 2 billion mark. And for five straight years, it was the number one, the most popular video on YouTube from 2012 to 2017. Now, for a brief moment, Psy and more importantly, Korea lost that number one perch, uh, thanks to the popularity of US pop stars such as Charlie Puth and Wiz Khalifa and Latin pop phenomena, uh, Luis Fonse of Despacito. But last year around this time, uh, Korea <laughs> managed to reclaim the number one YouTube video of all time with, I hate to say it, but I have to say it, but I love to say it, uh, Baby Shark. That too is also from Korea. Um, but you know, again, as much as YouTube has had a very important role on expanding not just K-pop, but really more importantly, K-pop culture, um, the relationship is by no means symbolic. If anything, it's extremely very symbiotic. Thanks to YouTube as a platform, um, we have seen um, anything and everything related to K-pop culture um, become less niche and more mainstream. And so if anyone, anytime around the world is curious about Korean movies, Korean TV shows, Korean cuisine, Korean fashion, K-beauty, um, really the only destination at the moment uh, that is a go-to for anybody, anytime, in any language, in any market in the world, it's YouTube. And so again, um, YouTube has been um, a very critical, but more importantly, a very essential key in the spread of not just K-pop or K-pop culture, but K-content worldwide. Wow. Thank you for your answer, Bonnie. And uh, it's a TMI for the viewers. Uh, right before we start this program, Bonnie was actually worried that his answer might be short. But thank you, Bonnie. You've given us enough answer to run the program. Oh, uh, it's it's interesting to hear that um, the group of people who are living in this country, South Korea, the artists, they started the YouTube channel and. They, I think they dream of making their channel big, but they've never expected it to be one of the most uh, valuable export um, assets in Korea. So thank you for wrap, um, clearing what happened in Korea on, and the platform that's called YouTube. Thank you, Bernie. And my next question goes to Dr. Terry. Um, I heard that you just hosted a conference in Washington, D.C. that featured the importance of K-content and its influence on Korea and Northeast Asia, and of course, around the world. So can you add to what Bernie just said in terms of its importance on Korean society and its economy? Sure, I'll try, but I can't follow Bernie. You see how he rocked, <laughs> he totally rocked at this yeah. conference, by the way. <laughs> it was a huge hit, thank you, Bernie. Uh, actually, President Moon Jae-in even tweeted our conference, FYI. Um, wow, that's great. I, I, and I, I, I think it's, you know, big part to do with what Bernie had to say. He, he truly was a hit. But anyway, thank you for having me, um, despite me being like a part of the older generation to invite me uh, to, part, to be part of this discussion. Um, you know, our conference was not just on K content, but how Korea's soft power more broadly impacts South Korea's economy and society and how, it, how this soft power allows South Korea to design a foreign policy that will give it a larger role uh, in global governance. Uh, and in terms of economic impact, I think that's pretty obvious, right? K-content creates further interest in Korean culture. Um, I was sort of floored to find out that some 7% of all visitors to Korea, South Korea, estimated 800,000 tourists to South Korea in one year. They visited because they said they were motivated by BTS, right? One band, one band alone. Uh, so imagine an, the, the impact of platforms like YouTube 
in which millions of people around the world now can regularly engage with K content um, and then get interested in, in Korean culture, in all things Korea, right? From food, mukbang, to K beauty, as Bernie mentioned, arts and crafts, all things Korean. Um, I think this, this uh, black pink that also Bernie mentioned, um, you know, I, I heard that, it, that it, uh, black pink has the most YouTube subscribers of any musical artist in the world. Maybe that's different now. I, I you know, it's something uh, statistic that I heard. Um, and, but even when you're not famous like BTS or Blackpink, um, platforms like YouTube really helps them reach new audiences, like music bands will just reach new audiences in the world, right? Um, I think I saw a survey that says some 72% of all media and music companies uh, with a YouTube channel agreed that uh, this platform helps them reach new audiences in the world, around the world. Um, some 65% of all creators agree that YouTube helps them export content to international audiences that, that they wouldn't be able to reach otherwise. And, and all of this has a rolling effect, right? Because it can lead to, for example, more foreign students wanting to, want to study in Korea. Foreign students studying in Korea grew at a rate of, at a pre-pandemic rate of uh, about 169,000 uh, foreign students in 2019. And you just compare that number to just uh, 12,000 foreign students in South Korea in 2003. Um, and so uh, just, just consider that number, um, you, know, um, you know, Bernie just mentioned that K-pop culture is number two export from Korea, right? Um, it's bigger than electronic exports. I mean, that's just, it's, it's a more than mobile, uh, smart mobile phone exports. Um, so that's, that's, that's huge. And what about gaming? I have, I have two teenage boys, so I can tell you. Now I know all about K gaming, <laughs> gaming mm -hmm. industry, um, which is we're talking about also youth economy. Um, the gaming sector also ranked like 100, over $100 billion in sales revenues in one year alone in 2019. So these are really, really incredible numbers. So for sure, the expansion of creative um, industries, K content, they're really paying dividends for Korea in, in, in the form of economic growth uh, for greater global influence. And I think there's even more potential for K content to captivate global audiences. Um, and you know, just success of K group is all the, the, the Squid Game uh, is also just one of that. This is more content out there. I think it's just, we're sort of just seeing the beginning of this. Um, we're not the end of it. I think we're just going to go further from here. Wow. It's interesting to hear that we still have more potential to grow the K content. Um, I hope to see what it will be, what will be looking like when it actually reaches the potential to the, to the limit. Thank you for the answer, Dr. Terry. And my next question goes to Minister Park. Um, of course, um, and as Dr. Terry mentioned, some of the big music companies in Korea use platform that's called YouTube, and then they use it well. Um, one of, for example, SM, one of the biggest music company and one of the most biggest entertainment company in Korea are well known for using global platform like YouTube so well. And another major, and yet less publicized issue in Korean economy is the positive impact of creative activities on the SME, small and middle enterprises, a sector that is absolutely critical in Korea. Can you talk about the importance of the creative economy and YouTube in the overall impact of SME development for the Korean economy? Thank you. Nice to mm -hmm. meet you all. Uh, 한국말로 하겠습니다. 네. Yeah. I trans. Uh, okay. 먼저 그 한국에서 이렇게 이제 그 유튜브를 활용해서 음 SM과 같은 빅 엔터테인먼트에 관한 질, 어, 질문도 해주셨습니다만은 어, 유튜브를 활용하는 사람들이 많고 또 유튜브의 영향력이 왜 이렇게 큰지를 한번 생각해 볼 필요가 있을 것 같습니다. 네, 통역해 주세요. Yeah. So you just uh, talked about how uh, major entertainment companies such as SM uh, in Korea are using YouTube. And um, I think we have to think about 
the fact that there are so many people who use YouTube, and we have to really think about why it is so influential and why so many people actually use it. Uh, 아마도 그 인구가 5천만 명 이상인 국가 아 uh, 국가에서 어 uh, 세계적으로 초고속 인터넷망 그러니까 브로드밴드가 전국적으로 깔려 있는 나라는 아마 대한민국이 유일한 국가일 겁니다. And I think one of the reasons uh, is that uh, when we look at countries with a population of over uh, five, uh, over 50 million, uh, I think Korea is probably the only country in the world that has a broadband access for the entire population. So fast speed, uh, broadband access for the entire population in Korea. 네, 그래서 한국이 이 브로드밴드를 전국적으로 깔기 시작한 것은 어, 2000년대부터였는데요. 어, 그래서 지난 20년 동안 한국에서는 IT와 관련된 부분이 에, 굉장히 급속하게 성장을 하게 됐고 또전 국민이 어, 이런 IT를 이용한 여러 가지 그 경제적인 활동 또 자기의 탤런트를 그 거기에 함께 접목시키는 그러한 역할을 할수 있는 것들이 굉장히 활발해졌었습니다. So um, we see that in Korea, uh, broadband uh, started being used in around 2000. So it's for about 20 years. Um, Korea has experienced a very rapid growth in terms of information technology and using technology. Um, so this means that the entire population in Korea is very used to using information technology uh, for uh, economic activities and also combining that uh, with their talent, and therefore, uh, the role of IT has become very vital um, in the Korean economy. 예를 들면 5G의 경우에는 한국이 전 세계에서 가장 앞서가는 국가입니다. 이것은 어, 어, 로스앤젤레스에 있는 그 연구소의 발표 자료이기도 한데요. 어, 그 연구소의 발표 자료에 의하면은. 어, 1G와 2G였을 경우에는 미국과 일본이 앞서갔고 어, 3G와 4G인 경우에는 어, 핀란드라든가 스웨덴이 앞서갔지만 5G에서는 한국이 지금 단연 1위를 달리고 있습니다. 그만큼 어, 유튜브를 사용할 수 있는 환경 그리고 이 속도 어, 인터넷의 속도 같은 것들이 전국적으로 골고루 이것이 다 갖추어져 있기 때문에 이전 국민들이 스마트폰을 사용해서 유튜브를 활용하는 활용도가 그 어느 나라보다도 높다라고 평가를 할 수가 있습니다. Uh, for example, um, when we uh, look at 5G, uh, Korea is definitely number one and uh, the pioneering leader when it comes to 5G. Uh, there was a recent um, uh, report from a research, agents, a research center in LA, uh, and they said when it was one for, uh, uh, 1G and 2G, US and Japan uh, was the leader, 3G, 4G, it was Finland and Sweden, but 5G, uh, Korea is the dominant number one player, um, th which means that Korea has the environment which makes it easier to use um, uh, YouTube. And also they have the internet speed to support this, uh, which, and which means that the entire population um, has this access. In other words, they just use their of smartphone uh, to freely use uh, and access YouTube. And that is why Korea is number one when it comes to these types of activities. 네, 그래서 이렇게 유튜브가 활성화되면서 어, 과거에는 어, 공중파 방송을 통한 어떤 그런 그 컨텐츠, K 컨텐츠가 만들어졌지만 요즘은 유튜브를 활용하고 스마트폰을 통해서 어, 각자가 집에서 어, 이것을 다 활용을 할 수가 있기 때문에 어, 그것이 에, 이런 어떤 그 개개인의 어떤 그 탤런트를 어, 발휘하고 또 스몰 비즈니스를 하는 그 중소기업 하시는 분들이 이러한 유튜브를 활용을 해서 자기의 제품을 선전한다든가 또 홍보하는 데 굉장히 많은 기여를 하고 있습니다. 어, 예를 들면 박말의 할머니 같은 경우에는 어, 그 할머니와 손녀딸이 둘이서 
같이 전국의 그 맛집을 찾아다니면서 어, 시작을 했던 그 유튜브가 어, 굉장히 인기를 끌어서 아마 이것이 전 세계적으로 굉장히 유명해진 하나의 좋은 예다라고 설명을 드릴 수가 있겠습니다. Uh, when we look at how vital, um, how vitalized YouTube has been, uh, we can see that that is now um, a very important source of Korean content. Before it was broadcasting, that was a major source of Korean content, uh, K-content. But we now see that uh, people, just individuals, use their smartphone to uh, load or um, express their creativity on uh, YouTube. Um, so uh, there, it has become a very uh, easy way for individuals to take advantage and show and express their talent. Um, and also not just individuals, but SMEs as well. Um, they use YouTube uh, very um, actively in order to promote their products uh, and they're contributing to this uh, creation of content as well. Uh, just to give you an example, p a n g n a r e who is a very old um, uh, grandma, and her granddaughter uh, has a YouTube channel where they, you know, roam the country finding the most, you know, f- uh, favorite eateries or restaurants, and that has become very popular. And now have they've become a uh, globally well known now. And I think this is a very good example. 조금 전에 그 설명을 드렸던 것처럼 뭐 먹방이라든가 아, 좀 전에 그 스위텔께서 말씀을 해주셨는데 먹방이라든가 이런 것들이 굉장히 활발하게 되는 이유도 어, 바로 이러한 그 개개인이 국민 한 사람 한 사람이 유튜브를 활용을 해서 어, 이것을 어, 구석구석에 있는 그 집, 맛집들을 찾아내서 알리고 이러한 것들이 굉장히 그 하나의 컬처로 자리 잡아가고 있기 때문이다 라고 생각을 하고 있습니다. And um, uh, Dr. Terry, I think, uh, mentioned mukbang uh, as well. And this has become a phenomenon, a global phenomenon as well. And this is because the individual now have a platform where they can share um, uh, the the rest, their favorite restaurants, what kind of food they like and how how they eat it. Um, So through YouTube, they go around, you know, sharing favorite uh, eateries um, uh, called, you know, matjip in Korea. Uh, so this in itself has become a culture as well. Mm-hmm. 그래서 이것이 이제 어, 그렇게 활발하게 에, 인터넷이 펼쳐지고 또 유튜브의 활용도가 높아져 가고 있는 때에 또 K-pop, BTS를 비롯한 K-pop과 같은 이러한 것들이 어, 더전 어, 그 세계에 알려지면서 어, 이 어떤 그 대한민국의 그 K 컨텐츠의 생산과 크리에이티비티 그리고 이것이 경제로 연결되는 이러한 어떤 하나의 그 강한 라인이 형성된 것이 아닌가 이렇게 생각하고 있습니다. 네. So as I uh, mentioned, this of uh, vitalization of the use of YouTube, but at the same time, this coincided uh, with you know a K pop. culture uh, dominating uh, you know the the world stage for example with BTS and now you know the entire world world knows about it so uh, the Korean content and the creativity um, and this impact because of this uh, impetus has all had an impact and contributing to the uh, economy of uh, the Republic of Korea and become a very important pillar. Uh, And so there is a a kind of line that has been formed between the Korean economy and Korean content and creativity. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Parker, for your answer. And we've been talking about YouTube and how it has impacted Korean economy, Korean society for more than 20 minutes. And I think think, um, among our groups, group of speakers, the next speaker would, would have more insights about the YouTube platform because he's working in the company. Um, my next question goes to Neil. Um, Neil, you've been hearing about the other people talking about YouTube for more than 20 minutes. In your opinion, how is YouTube thinking about its contribution to Korea? And how has the platform become such an important part of the Korean economy? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on this on this incredible panel. I've already learned a lot um, just just listening to my my fellow uh, esteemed panelists here. And uh, 
what I what I'm going to say is you know is not going to come as a surprise. Is really just going to build on what uh, what was already said, which is um, uh, Korea is an incredibly uh, important country for YouTube overall. Uh, my responsibility is you know all of our products globally, uh, so I, I get the privilege of that sort of global view. And so when I look at that across all the countries, uh, Korea is an incredibly important country for many of the reasons that were already highlighted. Uh, because it continues to break uh, barriers in, uh, in terms of culture, in terms of reaching unprecedented heights, in terms of milestones and stats and all of those things that were mentioned earlier uh, in areas like music and entertainment and learning and education. I could go on and on. And that's happening, of course, within the country. Uh, but it's also happening, as we all know, through this global, this Korean global wave. Uh, through K-pop, K-beauty, K-drama, et cetera. And I'll, I'll share some examples of that. But just to give you sort of taking a step back and giving you a picture, uh, um, you know, Oxford Economics just did some research uh, in terms of YouTube's contribution to the economy within the country uh, mm -hmm. itself. And that was something on the order of 1.6 billion uh, won contribution to the South Korean economy that translates into something like uh, 86,000 uh, jobs across the country last year. And so uh, we're proud of the, um, you know, kind of the uh, impact, the profound impact that the YouTube platform is happening, that's having on the economy through the power of all of these amazing uh, Korean creators that we talked about. For example, there's already 600 channels um, uh, in Korea that already have over a million subscribers on YouTube. Uh, 6,500 channels that have over 100,000 subscribers. Mm -hmm. And what's most important is that number has grown 40% year on year, just in the last year. Uh, and it's not just about big follower bases, fan bases. Of course, that's really important to the creative economy. But of course, the other part that's important is being able to generate revenue, to, to build a business, to sustain the production of this content through revenue. And so uh, the, on YouTube, there's... Um, uh, the number of channels that make over 10 million won a year uh, in Korea, that number is also growing. That grew 35% year on year as of uh, June this year. And so uh, profound growth in terms of the audience, uh, the revenue that these creators are able to generate in terms of this incredibly vibrant creative economy that exists on YouTube in Korea. And that, of course, is contributing to both that number of you know, 86,000 jobs in the country. Uh, you know, there's numerous examples, many of them cited here, cited here. Korea Grandma is one of my favorite uh, examples. I think everybody uh, knows about her, how she created her channel to stave off dementia. And now she's like this cultural icon, not just in Korea, but all over the world, whether it's fashion, pop culture, what have you. Uh, of course, there's all kinds of news around Blackpink and BTS. Uh, the Squid Game, uh, but there's all kinds of up and coming musicians, Big Marvel, et cetera, that uh, get their start on YouTube and grow this huge presence, not just within Korea, but all over the world. Um, one of the biggest trends that we've noticed actually in the last couple of years is the growth of uh, agritubers. And that's happening all over the world, but it's happening in particular uh, in Korea. And uh, in fact, uh, this type of content, uh, consumption of content on YouTube around farming has grown 300% uh, uh, on the platform since 2019. And so I could go on and on in terms of these types of examples. And so it's really about how YouTube allows for the building of this uh, you know, incredible fan base and then allows through our, our YouTube partner program, the monetization of all of that, whether it's through advertising, whether it's through things like channel memberships or paid digital goods where can, uh, fans can contribute to their favorite creators through products like Super Chat and Super Thanks and others. Uh, all of those are you know, means for creators and fans to connect, but also for creators uh, to be able to generate revenue. And so those are examples of how we really try to build a platform so that creators can build a community and a business uh, through all of these tools that we're delivering. Um, you know, for example, one of the most recent set of tools is a product called YouTube Shorts uh, that was used by BTS to launch their most recent single. Uh, and they were able to get the entire BTS army all over the world uh, to really get ahead of the, their official music video. It became this huge hit. And it's no secret uh, that they've had so much success on YouTube. In fact, four of the top 10 uh, kind of 24 hour debut records around music on YouTube are held by them because they're able to use all of these tools on the platform to really sort of tap into the, 
tap into the energy around their music, their fan base, et cetera. And um, you know, there's there's lots and lots of examples around that. One area that I'll I'll close on just uh, is what I think a lot of the other panelists have already touched on, which is the incredibly powerful influence that Korean culture has all over the world. Uh, you know, Dr. Terry mentioned Squid Game. Uh, well, one of the most popular videos on YouTube was created by a very large YouTube creator, Mr. Beast, one of the biggest. He built it on Squid Game. He did his own take on it. And so it's an example of how that cultural influence proliferates, not just from Korean creators, but spreads to all kinds of other creators on the YouTube platform all over the world. And, and um, so it has this uh, amazing kind of uh, multiplying effect, which of course is fun and entertaining, but is also, I think, uh, really influential in terms of spreading uh, Korean influence culture all over the world. It's not just about things like uh, uh, K-pop. Um, 35% of all watch time or consumption time of uh, content produced in Korea is actually consumed outside of the country. And so that just shows the power of the YouTube platform in terms of uh, spreading uh, Korean culture all over, the, all over the world. Nine of the top 10 biggest 24 hour debuts, debuts on, uh, on YouTube are from K-pop groups. I mentioned, uh, you know, BTS already, Blackpink is uh, also, um, and they are in fact uh, the largest uh, uh, music artist channel on, on YouTube. Um, uh, original artist uh, channel. And so those are just some examples of how YouTube contributes not just the ec economy within the country, but the proliferation of the culture and the creative economy uh, all over the world. Wow, thank you for your answer. And I actually had a couple of questions to ask you this this turn, but I think you gave give me enough answer to answer all the questions. So I'll ask you to the next, next speaker. And uh, before I move on to the next speaker, you just mentioned how many jobs YouTube created in Korea. And one of the jobs is the job I took. I began my, I, as I told you, I began my career on you, uh, my career in from YouTube. And I'm doing these moderating jobs and also doing interviews with the celebrities from Hollywood and et cetera. So thank you, YouTube, for giving me the job. <laughs> my next question goes to Mr. Minister Park again. Um, we briefly talked about the SMEs using YouTube and they're doing good at it. So how have you seen SMEs utilize global platforms like YouTube and how do you see the relationship between SMEs and YouTube evolving in the future? 네, 조금 전에 말씀하신 것처럼 정말 유튜브를 통해서 어, 많은 새로운 직업들이 탄생을 했습니다. 아, 인플루언서들도 많이 나왔고요. 또 게임 중개사들도 나왔고요. 아, 그런 것처럼 이 유튜브가 아, 우리나라의 그 SME에 미치는 영향은 굉장히 크다고 할수 있겠습니다. 네. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, YouTube uh, created many jobs, and um, I think this is the case. We see uh, YouTube uh, created a lot of influencers and also uh, gamers who broadcast games on YouTube as well. So this, of course, definitely has an uh, influence and contributed to the SME uh, economy as well. 특별히 최근에 와서는 어, 유튜브를 활용한 스타트업들의 활약이 눈에 띄고 있습니다. 어, 유튜브를 활용해서 에듀케이션 그러니까 교육 쪽에 에, 막, 이 스타트업들이 에, 글로벌화 되고 있는 그런 그 경향이 있는데요. 어, 특히 이제 뭐 수학이라든지 아니면 뭐 영어를 가르친다든가 하는 어, 이러한 그 스타트업들의 움직임은 어, 주로 젊은 사람들, 어, 영 제너레이션들이 시작을 해서 굉장히 성공하고 있습니다. Uh, I think what um, draws attention uh, these days is that we see a lot of startups uh, starting their business uh, recently on YouTube. And um, one of them, I think, uh, that we should pay close attention to is the education uh, startups. Uh, so they have um, started these education startup programs and it's becoming influential uh, around the world. And this has become a trend. For example, teaching math or English on the YouTube has become a startup business. Um, and especially it has started from the young generation and um, it's becoming quite successful. 또 특별히 K 뷰티도 이 유튜브와의 그 릴레이션십을 통해서 어, 굉장히 많은 성장을 하고 있다라고 생각합니다. 
어, 유튜브를 통해서 어떻게 하면 이 화장품을 사용해서 좀더더 더 아름다워질 수 있을까? 또좀더더 더 건강한 얼굴을 뭐, 뭐 보여줄 수 있을까? 하는 이러한 어떤 그 러닝, 티칭 프로그램도 있고요. 또 어, 단순하게 뭐 상품을 판매하는 그러한 유튜브 채널도 많이 있습니다만 어, 이런 K-뷰티와 관련된 다양한 컨텐츠들이 생산되고 있습니다. Uh, another industry that is taking, uh, uh, utilizing YouTube quite effectively is K Beauty as well. Um, so they have a very close relationship with uh, the YouTube, and has this industry has grown uh, quite um, rapidly on uh, YouTube. So they talk about uh, how you can become more beautiful using specific cosmetics or how you. can become healthier um, as well. So this is also in a way related to learning or teaching or guiding as well in terms of um, uh, K-beauty. And uh, some YouTube channels sell specific products, but uh, some also provide this uh, learning or teaching and uh, becoming a very important contributor, K-beauty uh, in the K-beauty industry. Mm -hmm. 또 패션이라든가 또 인테리어라든가 아니면 관광 산업에서 이 중소기업들이 유튜브를 활용을 해서 자신들의 상품을 설명하고 또 그것이 어디에 어떤 어그 크리에이티비티를 가지고 만들어졌는지를 잘 설명을 해서 어 소비자들과 친숙하게 되는 그런 여러 가지 많은 계기들을 마련하고 있습니다. Uh, other industries as well, such as fashion, um, uh, uh, tourism, uh, in, or in the interior uh, decoration, for example, these are all uh, YouTubes that the SME um, industries are uh, taking advantage of. So they talk about their products or uh, they find creative ways to explain uh, where it's coming from, what the background is. Uh, and this has become a new trend as well because uh, this feels uh, very close uh, to the consumer because they can access it right away. 그런가 하면은 또 정치 평론가들이 유튜브를 굉장히 많이 활용을 하는데요. 그것은 미국도 마찬가지다라고 생각하고 있습니다. 아, 그런데 이 정치 평론 평론가들의 유튜브 사용과 관련해서는 아, 너무나 또그 그 익스트림 울트라 라이트 오아 울트라 레프트와 같은 그런 성향을 보이는 그런 어떤 또 정치 평론가들도 많이 있어서 때때로 그것이 또 사회의 문제가 되고 있기도 합니다. 아, 또 특별히 또 가짜 뉴스와 관련해서는 이것이 좀 약간 심각하지 않을까 생각하는데 어, 유튜브에서 이런 가짜 뉴스에 대한 대응을 앞으로 좀더더 더 철저하게 해 주셨으면 하는 그런 바람도 있습니다. 네. Uh, also, political commentators uh, have you used uh, YouTube quite actively as well in Korea, but also in other parts of the world like the US as well. Uh, but I think the concern is that sometimes uh, their, their views that are extremely uh, to the right or extreme uh, left. And uh, this sometimes I think is a concern uh, because it can lead to uh, social um, issues. Another serious, I think, a negative impact that we can see is fake news on YouTube. Uh, this This can also become, be, be, become a serious social issue. So I think in this sense that YouTube has a role to play in uh, trying to deal uh, with the issue of fake news on YouTube. Yeah, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you for your answer, Minister Park. And thank you for your humble and gentle user's opinion towards YouTube. <sighs> Bernie, my next question goes to you. Um, when it comes to utilizing global platform YouTube, you've been a practitioner on this. What's your experience been on this platform and what are your big takeaways from it? And how have you, how have you used YouTube to complement other parts of your products and company, like live shows and et cetera? Well, you know, it's um, really interesting as, you know, as I was working in the music industry and music television industry for almost 20 years, mm -hmm. a lot of um, elementary school students, Korean ele elementary school students, when they were surveyed in terms of what are their most desired professions, um, for many years, being a K-pop star, or being you know, a top actor or actress was often in the top 10 or top five. Uh, not too long ago, the Korean government did a survey asking elementary school students what are their most desired professions, 
And, you know, at the top, there were some usual suspects, you know, obviously some students wanted to become doctors or teachers or a chef. But what was really interesting is more and more kids these days want to be just like you, a YouTube influencer that came in at number five in terms of most desired professions now for young Korean students. And um, I, I can really understand why. I think, you know, for me personally and more importantly, professionally, um, the impact of YouTube, particularly, um, you know, what I've seen, what I've heard, and more importantly, what I've experienced is really the power and influence of K-pop culture, um, expand not only the awareness, but also the appreciation of K-pop music locally, regionally, and more importantly, globally. Um, and I want to focus in particular on these three magic letters, UGC, user generated content. Um, it's often produced by K-pop fans and Korean music artists, whether they be icons, idols, or indie acts, have really been the beneficiaries of not only the 360 marketing that comes with YouTube, but also the 365 24 seven promotions. Anytime, anywhere in the world, pretty much in any language or any market, there is a K-pop fan spreading their joy, spreading their love for Korean music. And what we've seen or what I've seen is sort of this ecosystem that has evolved related to the YouTube platform. In the early days, all a Korean music artist had to do was just put their music video out there. But what we started seeing is the emergence of subtitled videos where fans would translate and add subtitles to their favorite songs. And then we saw reaction videos where fans around the world would watch a K-pop video and then provide their reactions to it. Um, often we started seeing cover versions of um, fans around the world, you know, either playing the instruments or some of them even doing dance performance videos. And occasionally we get some really inter interesting, amusing parody videos. But this whole ecosystem um, that's really evolved from the K-pop fan culture has not only really spread the love of K-pop, but more importantly, has actually helped enrich and empower K-pop artists. Um, for one thing, the um, way YouTube is set up, there are two tiers. One is the ad-supported freemium tier, and then there one is the premium subscription, paid subscription tier. And regardless of either tier, it's had an immense impact on Korean music artists' careers and livelihood. Um, one of the things that I've noticed with YouTube is because of the tools provided by YouTube to not only promote, but more importantly, protect Korean music and um, intellectual property, um, we've seen a large drop in um, illicit copyright infringing activities and piracy sites. And we've also seen that with Korean music artists, um, the revenues have grown immensely. Um, I know for me, for my company, it's been almost 10 years now since we have been working closely and directly with YouTube. And what we've seen are some pretty impressive numbers. Over the past five years, we've seen our revenues increase 5X on YouTube. And more importantly, over the past three years, uh, YouTube went from being a top three revenue source to now it is our number one revenue source for Korean music artists. And so, again, the impact of YouTube, not only on promotions and protection, um, but more importantly on um, profitability is something that, um, you know, is spreading not only to music artists, but to the influencers and fans out there. Um, we're starting to see many of these uh, fans, influencers become celebrities in their own right. And like the Korean music artists that they love and support, these influencers and these creators are now finding not only just livelihoods, but careers from the YouTube platform. Wow, thank you for the answer. And I think Bernie just gave us the important topic to talk about because he mentioned the ecosystem around the YouTube and user generated content. And also you mentioned it actually is becoming more profitable for the artists, for the creators that play on YouTube. Uh, hence my next question goes to Neil. Um, one of the key issues on YouTube is that the contents on YouTube is consumed responsibly. Users, advertisers, and creators, they all expect that YouTube is a safe and trustworthy platform to play on. So what kind of steps are you taking to ensure that YouTube is a responsible platform in Korea and around the world? Yeah, I think you hit it on the head with that question, which is, Nothing that we all have talked about here for you know for 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 this for this panel 
would be possible if it wasn't for um, the open nature of the YouTube platform mm -hmm. and then everything that we do to protect that openness on the platform. So, so whether it's all the economic success that musicians and artists and influencers and YouTubers have, or whether it's the large global audiences that they build and global influence uh, that they have, none of that would be possible uh, if it wasn't for the fact that YouTube is actually truly an open platform. It's a platform that from its inception has existed fundamentally without gatekeepers. If, you know, we, if you, uh, obviously you've done this with your own channel, but um, anybody can start a channel uh, uh, on YouTube, grow it, become successful, uh, and um, they can do that without have, seeking permission of a gatekeeper like traditional media has worked in the past. And that is the magic of YouTube. And that's our mission to give everyone a voice and to show everyone the world. And that can't happen without an open platform. But uh, part of being an open platform is that it presents this unique challenge of um, uh, what should be allowed on it, what shouldn't be allowed on it. And we've always, since the early days, uh, had community guidelines to protect this ecosystem of, you know, a couple billion users all over the world, um, hundreds of millions of users um, uh, of, of, um, of, you know, um, tens of millions of creators, tens of millions of users in, in Korea. So lots of uh, very large ecosystem uh, exists on our platform. And those community guidelines that are oriented around protecting viewers, creators, partners, advertisers, have had to evolve uh, with the growth of YouTube because YouTube is not just a reflection of what's happening in the world, it also has an impact on the world. And you know, Minister Park mentioned things like fake news, misinformation, combating that I think is incredibly important and um, is certainly my number one priority. It's the top priority across all of YouTube. And we have a, a, a kind of a holistic approach by which we do this. We call it the four R's approach. Uh, to our responsibility as a global platform. And the four R's are um, remove, which means that we endeavor to remove content, videos from our platform as quickly as possible when we deem them to be violative of our community guidelines, whether they are around uh, COVID misinformation or hate speech or harassment or any of the other ways that content can be violative of our platform. We wanna remove it uh, to prevent user harm as quickly as possible in uh, Q2 of this year, we removed on the order of 6 million videos from the entire uh, YouTube corpus. 55,000 of them were in Korea. Um, that, of course, is a very tiny fraction of the overall uh, video corpus of YouTube, but even a small fraction is something that we don't want to tolerate, we want to remove. So remove is the first pillar, but we don't just stop there. We also work very hard for the remaining kind of 99% plus of content that remains on the platform. We want to raise up authoritative content that comes from authoritative channels, credible channels around news or health. Uh, when people are looking for news, fast breaking news information, health related information to protect their families. So for example, in Korea, when people were looking for information around how to protect themselves from COVID early on in the pandemic, or now how they're looking for ways to get vaccinated and protect their families, we surface um, a COVID information, uh, uh, information panel right there on our home feed. We've worked in partnership uh, with the Ministry of Health to actually um, keep that panel up to date and put it in front, of our, uh, in front of our users. So we raise up authoritative content. And then we also reduce content that might not be quite policy violative, but is borderline in nature in our recommendations so that it doesn't spread harmful misinformation. And finally, we try to reward creators with all those economic rewards that I was talking about to the 99% of creators that are looking to do the right thing uh, um, and, and grow that vibrant ecosystem. So those, that's our four R's approach to making sure that we are living up to our responsibility, that we are cracking down on misinformation or any other type of violative on content on our platform. And that, is, that serves as the bedrock of everything that we do at YouTube. So everything else that we've talked about for the last 45 minutes around this incredibly vibrant uh, Korean uh, creative economy uh, can continue to flourish. Wow, I hope the full R policy goes well and it gets richer in the future. And Dr. Terry, uh, thank you for waiting for so long for your next question. My next question goes to you. Um, I also heard that you just wrote an article in Foreign Affairs about Korean soft power. Can you tell us about the role of global platforms, uh, in your opinion, what kind of role 
uh, global platforms like YouTube should play and what kind of role K content should play in the context of statecraft and expanding influence around the world? Yes, so that in, in that foreign affairs piece, which I wrote after the soft power conference, I called it the mm -hmm. Korean invasion. Um, I talk about how cultural exports can give South Korea a geopolitical boost uh, and how with a newfound clout in soft power, South Korea has a chance to um, take more active role in contemporary international politics. Um, how South Korea is perceived, right? Um, it matters with its K-content. When pe many people in the world perceive South Korea as cool, um, which is, you know, and, and that's fostered by platforms like YouTube, it does have geopolitical significance. So in the US alone, there was a survey that found some 77% of the Americans have a positive view uh, of South Korea in sharp contrast to let's say a country like China, um, for example. And so, and, and it matters because it then like South Power then strengthens the alliance between the US and South Korea um, and South Korea being viewed as a model of what 21st century Asian country can look like, right? With all this content, advanced economy, you know, democratic, technologically innovative, creative, culturally vibrant, and so on. Um, and, you know, this is a little bit of a side point, but Neil, it just kind of struck me because Neil talked about how South Korean culture is now spreading around all around the world. And although, you know, YouTube is not allowed in North Korea, for example, even in North Korea, it just struck me that South Korea soft power or is this key content is getting in there despite the Kim regime's efforts to crack down on this, right? I mean, the Kim Jong-un regime has been really cracking down on this. There is a reason why North Korean government describes all of this, this cultural exports as Nampung, right? Southern wind um, and as a weapon, uh, something as something that, that they are concerned about. Um, still, you know, North Koreans manage to watch South Korean dramas, listen to K-pop and, and all that. Um, and I don't know if anybody got to watch the, the crash landing on you, that's this drama, but they talk, they show North Korean villagers, yeah, North Korean villagers secretly watching um, these South Korean dramas and listening to K-pop and so on. Um, and, I, and I spoke to many North Korean defectors uh, who talk about how they admire South Korean culture after had been exposed to all of this. And that's why, you know, North Korean regime, I said, you can't even say that North Koreans cannot even use the word oppa, right? Like as in Gangnam, you know, Bernie talked about Gangnam style, but, you know, that's like, because it's like a Southern word. Um, in any case, so even, even in case like North Korea is sipping in there. And I, I think finally, I, I just want to say that even also in South Korea, I think one of the most interesting things is, so that's North Korea, but also in South Korea, um, the role of platforms like YouTube um, and K-content, what it plays, uh, it really uh, contributes to changing nature of South Korean society itself, which several guests, uh, the speakers just talked about. Everybody knows that South Korea has a very deeply rich Confucian culture, right? Um, but there have been issues with that, with that as well. There's some rigidity. And I think platforms like YouTube and K-Content uh, really promotes, um, it helps the society to change, to shift. Um, so the older tradition is yielding to a more vibrant, more creative um, ethos. Um, and so more creativity, more positivity. And I think uh, Minister Park talked about this. Um, I, I think it's a good thing that the young, uh, young Koreans are now being exposed to or are more likely to aspire uh, to be like you, you know, your, your, your YouTube influencer um, or, or have careers like this rather than just jobs as, as a salaryman in a large corporation, which used to be the case uh, in South Korea. And the number of Koreans now uh, employed in cultural fields are growing. Um, and I truly think this is not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing for South Korean society because it will help South Korea accelerate um, its transition from sort of um, an economy organized around heavy industry. This is what led to South Korea's economic growth in the decades ago, but now one that's focused on intellectual property and just creativity and innovation. So I think all of it, the bottom line, I think I see this shift that's also happening within South Korea. And I think it's a good thing overall.
you, Dr. Terry, for your answers. And I think we are almost running out of time. So I think I, I have to give my last question briefly to Neil. Um, we are hoping then we are dreaming that we are actually reaching end of the pandemic era. Still, we are living in the pandemic era, but still, we're still hoping. And we have this positive um, news coming out from the vaccine company and so on. So in your opinion, how has YouTube helped people and creators around the world in this pandemic era? And what do you think this platform will be like after pandemic era? era? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. And I think some of that remains to be seen as the world emerges from this pandemic. I think, you know, the way I think about it is that uh, the, the the pandemic really probably accelerated by 10 years, a lot of the trends that we were seeing before, whether it's commerce or live or what have you. And so some of the ones that jump out uh, to me in terms of the impact that YouTube has had is first and foremost, it's been around everything that I talked about, our responsibility as a platform, right? Making sure that uh, Korean citizens were getting high quality information around uh, COVID, how to protect themselves, news, how to emerge from the pandemic, get a vaccine, et cetera. That was first and foremost uh, kind of our priority and what we wanted to make sure happened smoothly, smoothly for, for our viewers all over, uh, all over uh, Korea. But um, one of the things that we saw early on from, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic was the need, as we all sheltered in place in our homes, for us to still come together as human beings. And a lot of that was happening on YouTube. A lot of those quote unquote sort of water cooler moments were happening on the YouTube platform. You know, you were probably doing that on your own channel. Creators all over uh, the world and throughout Korea were doing it. And those were live events. Those were community events, connecting with their fans. Uh, for example, in January, uh, Blackpink did the show, which was this first ever on YouTube paid virtual concert experience all over the globe that touched a fan base in 81 different countries. They had nearly 300,000 purchases of this concert. It was a huge, huge success. And it was because their fans really wanted to come together and obviously enjoy the incredible music, the community, but it was that sort of bonding music. So we saw mute moments. So we saw a lot of those types of trends. Additionally, shopping, obviously commerce has accelerated dramatically. Uh, YouTube, we've seen a lot of that. For example, just last week or a few days ago, uh, we ran a, uh, we piloted a live shopping event uh, on, on YouTube uh, where we had um, uh, Picky Eater from Korea participate. Uh, the products were sold out in less than an hour. Uh, users all over the world are hungry for commerce on platforms like YouTube. And that is obviously something that accelerated dramatically during the pandemic. The rise of VTubers. So these are creators that started with sort of anime-esque type presence on the platform uh, and now have blown into sort of full-fledged uh, avatars uh, for their channels. And this is, uh, of course, uh, countries like Korea and Japan are leading the way here, but that influence is spreading all over the world. Uh, and then finally, I'll call out um, the growth of learning. Obviously, this was huge on YouTube as children all over the world uh, were forced to learn online. Their schools were closed. One of the places that parents turned to, uh, of course, uh, was the YouTube platform. We saw um, you know, tremendous growth uh, in the type of, uh, uh, for searches for learning content, um, uh, learning how to do something, learning uh, an academic skill. So th that was another big trend that we saw emerge um, as a result of the pandemic. And I think many of these will continue as the world starts to come out. Uh, of this pandemic this month and going into next year. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Neil, for your answers. Um, I think that's all the time we have for today. So thank you, Neil, Minister Park, Bernie, and Dr. Terry for your insights and wonderful conversations. And I also have to say special thanks to Peter Stunke, uh, our IT director of the Korea Society for making this live webcast work today. And thanks to everyone at YouTube and the Korea Society who worked behind the scenes to make this program work. And of course, I have to say thank you to all the viewers and members of the Korea Society who have watched the program all along. We hope you'll join us uh, for the future programs. Do check out what is coming up on the Korea Society's website, koreasociety.org, and make sure you subscribe to the Korea Society's YouTube channel to have all our notifications go to your mobile phones. And for tonight, I think we are all done today. So have a good night. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Bye.